It's uh, such an honor and a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, I've already been introduced and my panel has been introduced, so half of my role for this morning is done. Uh, very much appreciate that everyone got up early and came and uh, is here to join this conversation. Um, we have an incredible um, group today, panelists from all over the world from various perspectives, and we have a very interesting uh, topic. The session is titled New Value Chains, Electronics, Ecosystems, and Prosperity. Our discussion will focus on some of the most valuable products in the market today, components of cutting edge technology, everything from batteries powering your phones and laptops, to electric vehicles, solar panels, wind turbines, energy storage solutions, AIs, and even drone. We will look at the ability to secure critical minerals, process and manufacture, and how the global self can move up in the value chain to challenge the traditional and dominant players to create more resilient supply chains, become globally competitive, and ensure environmental and labor standards that will benefit their populations. I'm gonna open this up by turning to former president of Bolivia, Jorge Curoga, to talk a little bit about Bolivia's experience. Bolivia is a mineral rich country, particularly in lithium used in batteries. What are the challenges to taking Bolivia into the uh, global value chains? What reforms are needed to participate actively? Well, thank you, uh, Sharon. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to begin by thanking ORF and the ministry for inviting us here. Uh, many have, I'm sure, have come from long distances, but I would dare to say that I'm probably here from about as far away as you can get from uh, Delhi. If you drill a hole through the center of the earth, you probably get to around uh, where I'm at in La Paz, Bolivia, which is also very high. If you want to win a trivia contest, ask the only place in the world where Messi has been four times and never scored a goal, La Paz, Bolivia, <laughs> is the home field advantage. Um, and that's home also the lithium. Um, in the value chains and the development of the world in the, in the digital sphere, let me make three points uh, on this. Uh, supply chains, trade agreements, and then the dig digital lithium world that we're gonna live in. First on uh, supply chains. I come from South America, and we learned through the 2008 financial crisis and then the post-COVID uh, era that Latin America is divided basically bisected by the Panama Canal. From the Panama Canal on north, still very much under the influence and the, and the leadership of the US vis-a-vis -vis migration, manufacturing markets, and what have you. From the Panama Canal on south, we're mainly Chinese because we have energy, food, and minerals, and that's what China has been buying this century at ever increasing prices, at ever higher volumes. And there is not a belt and road, but a belt and sea lane across the Pacific with intense trade links between South America and China, and that will continue to grow. And I say that uh, regardless of whatever your views are on China and a one-party state and whatever else. Uruguay, Ecuador have presidents that no one would call communist or center-left, they're probably center-right, but they each have signed a free trade agreement with China or are in, in the queue to sign a free trade agreement with China because th that's our natural partnership. That's the, the first point on the natural links that we have. The second, trade agreements. Piggybacking on what I just said, the reality that we see in South America frustratingly, is that the U.S. signed a slew of trade agreements in the 90s with Mexico, with the Caribbean Initiative, with the Andean countries, with South America in general, has taken a turn that is not related to Trump, but it, to the U.S. Congress and the way it functions or not functions, where uh, you cannot get a free trade agreement through the U.S. Congress as the Pacific no matter what, and that will continue to last for a while. And with Europe, the frustration is about the same. Mercosur, it's a bloc in South America that has, been, uh, that has engaged on the longest dating, never marrying trade negotiation in the history of the universe. Since 1999, EU and Mercosur have been negotiating a trade agreement of 25 years, and it has not come to uh, fruition. 
So when we hear in the US or Europe say, oh, South America, watch out for China, and uh, they're going to dump products and what have you, the reality is we have the trade links, the belt and sea lane, and they are open for trade business. That as an introduction, Sharon, to the final point on the uh, digital uh, sphere. Uh, yes, lithium is very important. 60%, depending on what study you believe, let's just say for the sake of argument, around 60% of the world's lithium supplies are in a triangle where, where I live between Argentina, Chile, and, and Bolivia. Chile, Argentina developing. My, our country is just still has it underground. Uh, we have a very inept government, but that's not what we're here to, uh, to discuss. But anyway, that creates an opportunity, and you know what is happening in that world. I tell people in my backpack up here in the room, I have nine lithium batteries that I travel with between watch, the Kindle, the iPad, the iPod, the phone, the other phone, the recharger, not a car yet or a motorcycle, but soon coming. Uh, but, but it is the world where, where, that we live in. Um, and that's very promising for the part for my country and where we come from. But the word of caution here, again, going back to supply chains in China is the overwhelming domination of China on EVs. The Economist cover that showed the EVs from China reigning on the world simplified what I need to say about that. Um, a lithium battery, in, in essence, Sharon, is a tennis match between uh, an Iranian Ayatollah and Djokovic. Um, Iranian Ayatollah is Khomeini, and you forgive the pun, but Khomeini, uh, cobalt, manganese, nickel on one side. And on the other side, Djokovic with a graphite racket. And lithium are the balls. You know, one side serves, they go charge, discharge, cathode, anode, charge, discharge. Now that is today. Uh, we're looking at iron phosphate to replace the cobalt, nickel, manganese. Lithium so far is the king. We'll see what happens with the uh, sodium coming up. But it looks very promising if you are a lithium producer. But we have to realize that of these materials inside this tennis match, cobalt, nickel, manganese, graphite, and the lithium, China is refining, not producing, but refining, between 63 and 92% of each of these five components. So if we want to move up the value chain, if we want to start making batteries in South America, we are going to have to engage and talk to China. Uh, a, a last point, not directly related to lithium, but in the world that we're living in, uh, with artificial intelligence is going to change the world more in the next five years than it's changed before. Th this is a fourth wave that will dramatically change more than the previous waves. The PC in the 80s, the web in the 90s, the smartphones in 2007, and now we're in the AI uh, uh, wave. That's going to bring about a lot of challenges. I'll just mention one that is very important to discuss in forums uh, like this. Where you house your data for privacy and security is an issue everywhere. I would suggest Europe has the best regulation. In Latin America, we do not have that capability. We could perhaps copy paste and clone European regulation vis-a-vis -vis data security and privacy. And if those issues are complex enough, just imagine when AI starts giving you judicial verdicts or health diagnostics. Will I accept in South America having my health data processing and diagnostics and judicial verdicts being fed into an AI LLM housed in Shenzhen, China, or Nevada, USA, and, and be given back to us? What do I do about sovereignty? Where is that housed? Can I house the NVIDIA chips? Do I have enough energy, infrastructure, telecom links to bring that to, to Brazil, to uh, Mexico, to Argentina, and what have you? That is going to be an ongoing challenge. Hopefully, we can house them as much as possible in-house, and hopefully, they're being driven with reliable, clean energy with lithium batteries made in Bolivia, but that's a challenge that we'll have to see. My final point, Sharon, is on India. I, this is a wonderful event. India has a lot of goodwill. Uh, we are in a quandary in South America because our natural alignment vis-a-vis -vis democratic values is with the US and Europe but our trade links and our lithium links are more with China. So now that India is the biggest country in the world and a lot younger than China, and it's got the future, the next 25 years is going to have a great run, I would suggest that India 
has to build the partnerships with the developing countries in Africa and South America to together learn how to best deal with the challenges on AI, on regulation, on where you house the server, on EV cars, and then we won't have to pick between our hearts and our pockets. Our hearts in South America with the European uh, American democratic values and our pockets with China. If India comes to the fore, then our hearts and pockets when we're from South America will be on the same side. Thank you. Thank you very much. A lot of food for thought and a lot of points that are gonna be brought up by our other panelists. Um, and thank you for the, the visual understanding of how lithium batteries work. I don't think anyone in this room is, is gonna forget that. Um, I'm gonna turn over to um, Deputy Minister Lu Qingtong, someone who deals with China a lot, um, to talk a little bit about Malaysia, which contributes 7% to the global semiconductor trade as the sixth largest exporter of semiconductors. What are the key elements that allowed Malaysia to become a player in this space? Thank you, Sharon. What happened in the world in the years to come will be colored by the relationship between US and China. Whether you call it decoupling, de-risking, or whichever, that will color the future. And we have already seen this, that is either home shoring, the response is home shoring, which is uh, moving back some of the capacity in China to, United, to the United States, to Germany, or uh, near shoring to Mexico, to Poland, to Eastern European countries, or French shoring to Japan, to South Korea, uh, to India, and the next is Southeast Asia. Malaysia occupies a very interesting position. I say that Malaysia occupies three middles in, in this whole process. First, Malaysia is in the middle of the global supply chain. We contribute 23% of US semiconductor trade. Not very well known, but we are there. Yet we are not doing FAB. We are in the testing, uh, assembly, and what they call the packaging. So we are an indispensable middle in the global supply chain. Not high enough, not low enough. And this is where I think some form of vertical integration can be formed with the developed nations. I was in Detroit and was in DC, I was talking to a US official, I said, we understand that the US current politics will not permit the form of a FTA of the, of the past. But it doesn't mean that the US cannot extend or the coordinate policy between Brazil, Malaysia, uh, say for example, uh, India, on semiconductor and on other on other other businesses, in order to reach my third point, where I think this whole wave is a once and once in a generation opportunity for Malaysia, for many other countries, to build a middle class society. We have experienced. Uh, at least 30, 40 years of neoliberal economic policies. It didn't bring enough opportunities for our people. Partly because China was the only factory for around 20 years. When China joined WTO, China was the only factory of the world. The world could operate. Everyone else became financial center. Those who used to be industrializing like Malaysia back in the 90s, by about 2000, China became the factory of the world. Malaysia and many South American countries, many Asian countries experienced premature deindustrialization. This is an opportunity for Malaysia and many other countries to have clear aspiration to create a middle class society in the years to come. ASEAN particularly should think through and see how to ensure that in this wave and this, this reorganization of global supply chain, we must ensure that there is a flaw, that we do not raise to the bottom in terms of labor standard, we do not raise to the bottom in terms of environmental standard, and we must ensure that, say, in the next 5, 10, 15 years, we create as many middle-class society, societies among developing countries. 
If we look back when China joined WTO in 2001, China had about 100 million population who are considered middle class. Today, 20 over years later, China had four, has at least 400 million Chinese who are considered middle class. And we should envisage that our society in the years to come will be able to co coordinate horizontally in order to create the floor and to rise together. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we'll come back to that conversation about putting people first in this new phase. But Yanka, I'm going to turn to you um, to talk a little bit about the geopolitical dilemma that Europe is facing. I think with the uh, war in Ukraine, um, Europe really realized its overdependence on Russia for oil and gas. Um, and in order to diversify its supply chain and support its green transition, um, Europe is going to be needing to look elsewhere. However, as panelists have already laid out, China is dominant in, um, as a player in the rare earth and critical minerals, a vital part to EVs, to solar panels, to wind turbines, to electric vehicles, et cetera. So given China's dominance, rising tension in Asia, uh, China's history of using economic bullying, how does Europe ensure that it's not just trading one geopolitical challenge for another? I think when you nicely sum up all the challenges that Europe is facing, it's just like, we're screwed is probably the right answer that we can start the day with. No, but let's not start on such a pessimistic note uh, here, maybe. I think, Mr. President, you just said um, like China is a natural partner in a way. For Germany, that held true for so many years. We thought that was going to go really well for us, and it did for a really long time. As long as there was complementarity, there was no problem. But for Europe, and for Germany in particular, complementarity has turned into competition. And now the world looks very, very different from that German perspective. And I think, um, Sharon, you raised critical raw materials, and that's a big discussion in Europe as well, and how do we de-risk from that? But actually, what we are looking at is a problem that is much bigger than that. Um, if we're looking at the EV sector, and you've already mentioned it, what we're looking at is the potential eradication of the European auto industry within the next five years. Um, and that's bigger, it's a bit much bigger problem than our critical raw materials supplies in the short term for voters, for democracy, for stability, for the future of our economies. And so I think this is where the kind of the challenge that we're facing has to be framed correctly. It comes with us at a speed that is unprecedented and very difficult to deal with for democratic societies. It comes at us with a scale that is absolutely unprecedented. And sorry, any comparison to the 1970s and Japanese cars is just really not adequate for what we're facing here. And so this is something that um, the European are beginning to realize how their different um, priorities, policy priorities, will create different sets of trade-offs and really, really difficult and hard questions. So for us, it is about finding a new de-risking version. How do we de-risk from all of those different challenges that we're facing at the moment? It's not just driving the security risk down, the national security risk down. It's not just driving the economic risk down. It's also about driving the climate risk down. How do you weigh all of those different priorities that you have as a policy leader then? when you are facing up to these challenges. So what we are having to find out is that we will need partners for this. So far, de-risking agendas in Japan, in the United States, in Europe, have been very inward focused. It's like, how can we get safe? It's very defensive. It's like, how can we make sure that we cut off dependencies? How can we make sure that we not? So where we need to move towards is sort of a de-risking for all agenda. If the Europeans can put themselves at the heart of an agenda like that, an inclusive de-risking agenda that actually takes the abilities of others into account and takes the risks of others into account as well, I think we will much be much better um, at performing in a different world. What that needs, though, is a pro-competitiveness agenda. It's not an anti-China, it's not a pro-de-risking, it's pro-competitiveness. What Europeans want is a competitive industry and competitive markets also for themselves. The best thing would be for European consumers to have Japanese, Indonesian, Korean, American, and European cars all competing in the market. But for once, I have to agree with Elon Musk, and that's a hard thing to do for me. Um, he said last week um, that if Chinese cars um, are not kind of, if, if they're free flowing in the market, then there is not going to be competition any longer. And we can trace that across industries. Um, that that is exactly what is happening. Those are the dynamics. Once the, the, car, the, once the big Chinese players enter global markets, it eradicates competition for everyone. And so I think um, building a big alliance of pro-competitiveness countries is actually a really good idea. I'll end with that. 
Rachel, I'm going to turn to you for the U.S. perspective. We've all touched on it a little bit here, so you're kind of on the spot as our American voice on the panel. Um, you know, due to the acute supply chain issues that became so painfully obvious during the global pandemic, um, as well as the geopolitical risks that were spelled out earlier, the Biden administration made uh, a number of major efforts to de-risk the supply chain, to bring home manufacturing, French shoring. Um, I was going to ask, you know, what is it going to take for the global south to attract U.S. companies and FDIs? But let me flip that and say, when will the U.S. realize the opportunities that exist in emerging economies? And is the U.S. going to be a player in the new game? No, I definitely think that's the right way to frame that question. Um, one thing I would say is that it's really important to note just how focused Washington is on countering China in the manufacturing space. And I like to say if there is one thing that unites Republicans and Democrats today, this is the most polarized that the United States has been since the late 1960s. Um, but in terms of our domestic politics, in terms of foreign policy, if there's one thing that I like to say unites the two parties, it's this hawkishness towards China. It doesn't matter if you're talking to someone uh, that works for the National Economic Council, for Biden, or if you're talking to a former Trump official, you will hear uh, similar messages, although they'll be wearing maybe different clothes. Um, so when you look at Biden's legislation, the Inflation Reduction Act, this uh, foreign policy for the middle class, Build Back Better, the Chips and Science Act, these are all about revitalizing the US manufacturing sector, yes. Um, but the thing that we don't say as loud is that uh, China is obviously a big part of these decisions and a big part of this legislation. Um, and the reason I refer to these specific efforts to answer this question is because in this moment, I think that we're seeing somewhat of a convergence of goals. Um, the US wants to be a bigger player uh, in this space, be better at uh, investing and building relationships with the global south, compete with China, obviously. Um, and it's making strides to do that, albeit a little bit late to the game, I, I will admit. Um, which in turn, I think, supports various countries in um, building out their uh, domestic and global manu manufacturing markets. Um, the thing I worry about is that we might not have the right tools in the box and the right approach to this. I worry that um, the approach that the United States takes to this is very zero sum. It's an us versus them approach. It's, uh, and I worry that we put, potentially will put the uh, countries in the global south in the same position that we've put our European allies um, in, in, in the uh, manufacturing space, especially when it comes to China, which is um, you either look east or you look west. And I don't think that is uh, conducive to a pro-competitive um, environment, I think, as, as Yanka said. Um, and in terms of the tools in the box, I think that, unfortunately, in the United States, um, the tools that we have are seen as tools of development. And that, I think, is seen as somewhat of a different ball game to people. So I look at something like the Development Finance Corporation, for example, uh, which is seen as the, you, you know, the US Development Bank. But the key word there is development, right? Um, so when you look at countries in the global south who want to move up the global value chain, um, development and manufacturing are very much interlinked. And uh, we have to answer questions about how to de-risk, how to attract um, outside investors, how to attract foreign uh, direct investment. And if we, the United States continues approaching this, I think through the lens of development, then we're sort of missing the boat here. So I think I'll end with that. Thank you very much, um, and a great segue to talk with Jaivir a little bit about, uh, from an Indian perspective, and, and FDI and a bit of a paradigm shift, and as we were talking about earlier, putting people first. So uh, you argue that while it's unrealistic to negate profit motive, um, you, one can find a middle ground uh, between societal benefit and profit. How do you make that case to investors? 
So uh, thanks for that, Sharon, and, and, and great to be here with all of you. Um, I want to step back a little bit because I think the development model that has been uh, the status quo for the last 50, almost 100 years now, has been somewhat skewed towards a particular narrative. And that narrative essentially has been that it's self-interest which will drive the broader interest. Uh, I think with the global south coming to where it is at the moment, Rachel, you make a great point. Uh, I do still think that development finance has a role to play. Uh, whilst I think the excessive profit motive could take a somewhat linear tone. Um, and what I mean by that is that if you th take India or China's example for that matter, uh, and you look at inequity and you think about you know, people moving from uh, below the poverty line to above, a lot of this has been driven by investment, which is, uh, which is state investment, but also private sector investment. And so I think uh, it's not one or the other, both have a role to play. And so for us, in part, the argument for me sitting in what I do uh, for PwC and in, the bro and in the broader context, it's about being able to find that middle ground. Um, how do you find that middle ground? Uh, it's, being, it's to be able to see partners. I think friendshoring and nearshoring are, are interesting words to use for today. Um, this idea of, of uh, deglobalization as well. Uh, we can talk about it as much as we want, but we are interconnected and interdependent. But what are those partnerships for the future? Uh, based on self-interest, but at the same time, also looking at uh, the interests of those that don't have enough. And I think part of what the Global South needs to come together on is the idea that we have value and we have the ability to move up that value chain. Um, uh, the skilling element of it is happening. Some levels of the technology transfer is happening. But at the same time, I think that there is still a great inequity as I think about the way that investors look at uh, long-term development. Um, we need to move beyond the quarter and quarter. If we're going to talk about sort of the more global trends in terms of migration, someone's the minister spoke of it earlier, um, the idea that we need to create value in a more localized context versus the parachute form of development that we've been used to historically is something that, that, that I think is, um, is the only way for the future. As I think about the electronic sector, um, and I think about mobile telephony, for example, what that's done to emerging economies in terms of being able to bring people into the forefront of economic development, uh, it's unprecedented. Um, and so as I think about manufacturing value chains as well, I mean, India has taken great strides over the last 10 years or so. We moved from a you know, 60 million, give or take, uh, um, uh, 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 ma uh, manufacturing capability of uh, mobile phones to you know, almost 350 million today. Uh, I think we're seeing that in the global south, but more partnerships, more partnerships based on shared value, equitable shared value versus the parachute form of the big brother type of argument is what we need for the future. So I'll leave it with that, that I think for all of us who are sitting on the panel and, and, and some of us from the global south, more partnerships of that kind between like-minded partners, right? Going away from the status quo of, West and East, to some extent, is what we need to look at as we think about the future. And who's going to be a leader in that space? Is this an opportunity for India? Great opportunity for India. I think, and, and as I think about what Minister Jayashankar said previously, or for the last 10 years, what the government has done, uh, the capacity and capability enhancement that we've had in India is, again, unprecedented as I think about the last 50 years. So. Great opportunity in India. Uh, I mean, the Make in India is a classic example of a government initiative, right? Uh, but along with that, the private sector, the auto industry, you spoke ab about it before, um, has, been, has been at the forefront of Indian companies going to the world. And today we're known for it. The same way, I think, in the electronic sector, and uh, I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag, but we will launch a report tomorrow, which is going to talk about some of that India advantage. So look out for that and watch that space for more. Thank you very much. Um, I had a whole slew of questions um, here, but I also am sensitive to the fact that we only have 50 minutes, and I want everyone to have the opportunity to join in the conversation. You know, it's a, it's a packed schedule, and you're going to be sitting on panel after panel after panel, but we have a l number of experts here in the room and a number of people who, you know, woke up early and came here to have this conversation. So I'm going to throw it open to the audience a little bit earlier and take uh, three questions. It can be on you know, any of the subjects that were touched on earlier from the panelists or something that we haven't talked about yet. 
But I'm going to ask you um, not to give a statement, but instead to ask a question and to please give your name and affiliation as you introduce yourself. We have um, some mics in the back of the room, so please raise your hand. Yes, sir. Microphones? <laughs> Uh, morning panel. Uh, very stimulating uh, discussion. Uh, I'm a researcher in uh, Manohar Parikar Institute of Defense Studies and an analysis. Uh, when I look at, uh, you know, when I meet uh, leaders from around the world, uh, the general impression is Indians are great innovators, they work for companies. But when I look at our startup, the way our MSMEs are coming up in new technology, and when they want to look at the partnership, most of the global leaders view them as a, you know, supply chain, uh, suppliers of their uh, value chains. Has the time come to have a partnership in emerging technologies, innovative technologies, where Indians can be part of the global uh, innovation ecosystem? So, so I would like any of our, you know, people to comment. Because our startups are looking at the partnership in innovative technologies. And the advantage we have is of reducing the cost, matching the cost competitiveness in the global environment. Thank you. Thank you. Any other gentleman Hi. in the front? Oh, you already have a mic. Please go ahead. I do. I do. Thank you. Uh, Marina Rodiak. I'm from Germany, Heidelberg University, and I'm a researcher. I'm working on China Global South relations. Um, and I could not help but notice how different the perspective on China is on the panel between the Global South perspective and, and the European and American perspective. And um, the um, statement by um, President um, Hiroga that the hardest with Europe and the, with the West, uh, but uh, the economic ties are with China and the economic expectations are on India. Um, makes me wonder whether kind of Europe has lost the trust of the global south and how convincing uh, the arguments um, brought up were um, to join Europe as de-risking partners and to have a joint competitiveness agenda. Because let's be honest, you could make the argument from the European perspective that, well, we were pro-competitiveness as long as we were competitive. And now that we are not, uh, kind of, uh, we are uh, looking for partners to be competitive again. So, you know, how can you be sure that it's not going to happen to you next time? And um, do European or even American arguments not, don't, don't they sound like it's more about our China problem than joining together on development issues? So, sorry for playing the devil's advocate here, but I'm really looking forward to your perspectives. Thank you. And just one more question here in the front. Hi, I'm Pablo Sonia from E3G. Some of the tactics that uh, developing countries are using is to have export controls or restricting exports of their natural resources or nationalizing uh, leave to Mexico, Bolivia, uh, Chile. How effective do you think these strategies are to condition their resources for increased supply chains back home? Is it working? Is it a failed attempt? Uh, what are your thoughts? Thank you very much. Who would like to go first? Minister? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Let me take a, take a look at the situation in China. Because we are talking about China, but we, we do not necess necessarily talk about China itself. China is now facing the first in 45 years, a situation first in 45 years, where many Chinese think that next year would not be better than this year. For the last 45 years since 1978, most Chinese, most of the time, think that next year will be better than this year. Next generation will be better than this generation. But now there is a crisis of confidence. Fundamentally, China has already created technology, created jobs, and created relatively high wage, as, as, at, at least in the eastern seaboard. And China was attempting to shift from an export-led economy into dual circulation 
so that it has a sizable consumption market and the, the sizable cons consumption market can sustain China to a certain extent self-sufficient. However, many Chinese are not spending now. Much as they may have high wage, they may have, but they are not sure about the future. And part of the main problem that they are not sure about the future is that they are not sure about healthcare. They are not sure about social security. Okay? They are worried about, let's say, what happened if I go to the hospital, I have to pay. So the Chinese are not spending now because not because they don't have jobs, but they, they are worried about the future. They are worried about the uh, healthcare. They are worried, worried about social security. At some point, the Chinese will have to rethink healthcare. They will have to rethink social security. I'm saying all this because the middle class society that Chinese has created over the last 20, 25 years is amazing. It should be the future for developing countries where we create sizable middle class society that are not just workers, but also consumer. Say in ASEAN, in India, we should develop and strengthen our middle class society so that they are not just workers for multinationals, but they are also consumer themselves in order to sustain the global economy. But this, the lesson of China is also a question that we have to deal with. How do we ensure that whatever we are talking today will create better jobs, better pay, and we will create the healthcare system, will create the social security where our people will be prepared not just to be workers, but also consumer and consume with a secure sense that next year is better than this year. I think these are the questions that we'll have to deal with uh, in the years that to come in order to avoid the situation where people are rich, but they, are, they don't, to, don't dare to spend. Um, so uh, maybe two points, one on the export controls maybe and whether it's working or not working. I think we will only see that in the longer run. I, don't, I think it's sli slightly bit too early to say what is exactly working and what is not. But I can say it's probably working better with Europeans than it will be with China. Um, that is for sure. Um, I think the leverage is targeted at the right kind of countries at the moment. And I think that can actually work quite well because the sense and level of desperation that we have is quite high. Um, and, and that's usually a good bargaining position for others, let's put it like that. Um, and, and I think the same holds true sort of for the argument of saying, you know, we, we want a competition agenda as long as we can be competitive. I think that's very true, but who doesn't? And I think that's also, there is sort of no alternative to this current approach for the Europeans. And for the first time, they realize that. that there is really no alternative to a new approach to things. Now, are there forces of inertia in Europe that will make that really difficult? Let me tell you, there are <laughs> lots of them. Um, and they're not only in Brussels, they're all over the European continent, basically. But I think what I want to kind of send as a message here is that the kinds of discussions we're having now over the last few years, basically since the invasion, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, um, are so different in terms of the level of urgency than they were before. They're so different with the variety of the challenges that Europe is facing that I don't think a Europe in despair is a good thing for the world. I think a Europe that is kind of a strong force for a rules-based order is a better thing for the world. So I do think that there is some opportunity in that for others as well to engage. Um, and I think, you know, now's the time to start bargaining with the Europeans. Mr. President. Thank you. I guess we're going down, down the line. Uh, uh, three quick points. One, uh, Juan Carlos mentioned the uh, export restrictions, uh, nationalization, what have you. Yes that is happening on the mineral side, but we're also seeing not only export limitations, but import restrictions when it comes to the uh, Europe and uh, his view on cars and the US <laughs> and in cars. I never thought I would see the two candidates for president in the US running over each other, headed to Michigan to protect Michigan and the auto combustion engine industry from the EV uh, cars, but that, that's what's uh, been happening. I think that's a, a natural impulse that is taking place in a lot of different uh, areas. I would say from a South America standpoint, lithium is our chance to move up the supply chain. 
and leave behind the days of Galeano, you know, the open veins of Latin America and our blood being taken out by the Europeans and the Americans. Well, now it's the Chinese. Perhaps it's not so aggravating, but we do have a chance to move up the, the, the supply chain uh, with lithium. Second point on uh, the point that was made on, on Europe. Yes, I think uh, I don't envy Janka and the <laughs> challenges that you have, uh, but we will have to see, can Europe live without Russian gas supply and perhaps without full US military protection and perhaps with a weakened or eroded car manufacturing uh, industry and not very favorable demographics, it's quite a challenge. <laughs> We, we shall see, we shall see, I, I hope it does, because in, in this world where we're fighting between US and China and their tech platforms, and you know, the old saying that US innovates, China replicates, and Europe regulates, to me no longer applies. US and China both are innovating, if not as TikTok, their algorithm programming is better than the Instagram reels and the YouTube shorts, and the young people will tell you that anywhere. So I think there is something to be said for the importance of Europe as the only large market with regulatory capabilities on the digital world and what is, what is coming uh, uh, up ahead, including artificial intelligence, which by the way, uh, the monster of the large language models has eaten all the text. So what are you gonna feed the monster for AI later? Video images that are gonna be the back cameras of cell phones, and China, India have huge advantage on that, and the cameras on EV cars, which are rolling studios, where China has a gigantic advantage. So I hope, because Europe, we learned a lot from Europe financial regulation, I hope they stay on their feet, but it's gonna be very tough and challenging times. The last point on the question on, on India and the, and the supply chains, I, um, I'm old enough to tell you that I was an IBM systems engineer that sold big mainframes for IBM. That was the big iron. Uh, PCs were just like little toys. You know, companies make strategic mistakes. IBM said, oh, we will let these two geeks from Washington State, Bill Gates, do the operating system for this little PC toy. And here's Microsoft, and, and, the, and there went IBM. But I remember I went to the Boca Raton uh, manufacturing site for IBM and I heard the guy saying, you know this 10 megabyte hard drive for the IBM PC, early 80s? <laughs> said, we're gonna start buying it in Taiwan because they make it cheaper. And that's like a little favor to Taiwan. And look at Taiwan now. I look at TSMC now. and look how the world changes. My suggestion, India has an advantage that Taiwan never had. The largest market in the world for the next 35 years. So that gives you great advantages. I know you're bringing Apple manufacturing, iPhone manufacturing. You have so many different uh, opportunities uh, coming ahead. And I do hope that India engages taking advantage and piggybacking on the most successful G20 so far lately, which was the one that you hosted here. It was masterful diplomacy. It will be studied for a long time. I hope Brazil can take a page out of that for the next, uh, G20, but it brings you a, a great, great opportunity because of the size of the market. Yes, China's GDP may be two and a half times yours, but your population under 35 is almost twice what China's proportion is. So that brings about a lot of different uh, opportunities and, 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 and ways to address the challenges. And by the way, last factoid on India that I admire, you have a great diaspora. You know, Latin American diaspora, they're kicking it out of the U.S. <laughs> Uh, the Africans out of Europe is difficult, but the Indian diaspora sends remittances. It's all over the world. And there's um, something to be said for India having people from this country that run Microsoft, that run Google, have the number two job in the Democratic administration with Kamala Harris and the number two contender on the Republican Party. Not bad. I'll be really quick. I'm glad that you mentioned Mexico because I wanted to, to mention Mexico uh, in, in my opening remarks. Um, I think it's interesting to look at what's happening um, as a neighbor of the United States, but also how China is using Mexico as a workaround <laughs> for US uh, tariffs. So, um, you know, there's this history of uh, Chinese companies moving to Mexico. Uh, it's been trying to lure Chinese companies in for a long time, but until Trump came into office, 
uh, and uh, put in place uh, high tariffs on, on Chinese goods, and then Biden decided to keep those in place, there wasn't really a need. Um, so today it's sort of a win-win for both sides, right? You have China, which still has access to one of the largest, uh, one of its largest export markets. Uh, it can sidestep U.S. tariffs, and the U.S. can continue to import uh, low-cost goods. Um, in fact, shipping uh, coming directly from China to the U.S. last year accounted for less than 15% of U.S. imports. That's down from um, over 25% or over 20% in 2017. Uh, but what those numbers don't account for is the goods that are still being imported uh, to the U.S. but using Mexico as a, a go-between. And that's where the numbers, I think, get more interesting. And Mexico last year was the largest trading partner of, of the United States. Um, so looking ahead, to, to November, we can use terms like friend shoring, we can use terms uh, like near shoring. Um, it's sort of dressing different terms up, uh, like I said before, in different clothing. Um, but I would expect the Biden administration to be under increased pressure from uh, things like unions, from Congress, to tighten these rules uh, that will then close these unintended um, openings. But then also a next Biden administration or a Trump administration to then put pressure on Mexico to close them as well. And it's gonna be really interesting to see, I think, how that turns out. Yeah, so very quickly, I'll pick up both. But um, just on, India's never had a situation of where it is at the moment in terms of the amount of free trade agreements that it's cu currently considering, right? Including ones that are pretty individual and based on self-interest. And I think we should like, we should, um, uh, we should dwell on that a little bit because, the, again, the historical model was one which was pretty in inequitable. I'm not going to I'm, I'm not going to name uh, the country, but a few years ago we had, um, you know, a, G a G7 country prime minister be in India, presented a free trade agreement to the Indian government. It essentially lapsed because it was coming from a principle of a colonial mindset of the past. Right, quite frankly. So, so I think what you're finding, and we had Minister Goyal who's gonna to come tomorrow and he spoke with us some time ago, the amount of free trade agreements, uh, not just with, for example, a block like the EU, but we have a $100 billion investment which is being considered by four members of the EU, independently, quite outside of the EU block. So it's not the typical models of engagement that I think existed historically. We're looking at different ways of being able to do that, but that's partially because of the importance of the Global South. And I want to reiterate that, that the conversation that we're having at the moment is because there is the emergence of the kind that there is, and we should be cognizant of that. I think on the MSME point, you couldn't have it more right. Um, we need to shore that up more, but I'll use two examples there. I used the example of the auto industry uh, previously, small, uh, small industry, which became medium, and now today is a global exporter, right? So we have some examples there, but as we move up the value chain, we spoke about Apple, um, there are some other conversations happening on the electronic side as well, right? Uh, but the, it, the, that argument is not just an external argument. Um, the gentleman from uh, uh, Lucerne yesterday um, was talking about the fact that, you know, there are Indian scientists which are working on the hydron uh, collider. So if, if, if I think about the Indian space program and the integration of that space program back into industry, we haven't done enough of that internally in India. So I think a lot more of that technology transfer can actually happen onshore without us needing to look offshore. Thank you. And I'm afraid we're out of time and we've only scratched the surface. I have so many follow-up questions and I know everyone here does as well, but the panelists will be around today. You're welcome to, to harass them later with your, your personal questions. And I just wanna say um, a word of thanks for all of you for taking the time to be with us today for sharing your insights. And I look forward to continuing this conversation both here at Ricina, but also seeing how this develops, um, you know, in next year's Ricina or five years from now and seeing how, how the world has changed. And, and hopefully there's a lot more um, efforts from the uh, European Union and from the United States to bring in the voices of the global South and create these new value chains that are gonna be beneficial for all. So thank you everyone for your time. And we've hit zero. <laughs>